The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Aloha. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm quite well. How about yourself? Good, good. Thank you. Sounds like the um, the conference is coming along. Yes, Great it list is. Of it's speakers right. already. It's gaining momentum. Yeah, it's gaining momentum. We're Crypto right Zoidberg back. reached out to us. I know that's pretty awesome. awesome. Like, I had that in my. I, right? Even yeah, we had it on the list. <laughs> One hell of a name. I hope yeah, he makes the noise. The <laughs> He's an interesting character. Yeah. Slightly controversial. I don't know. There, there's, there was some controversy. Uh, did you watch that interview when we had him like a year and a half ago, two years ago? I guess not. I, I feel like I would have remembered the name Zoidberg. Uh, yeah, so I must have missed that one. Check that out. He claims to be in direct contact with uh, Nicholas Van Saberhagen. No kidding. That's yeah. cool. Not many people know Satoshi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, take it away on price. I think things things are looking good, right? In terms of at least Monero versus BTC. Yeah. Um, so we've got all our Monero charts right up here. Uh, I made a little change. Um, I noticed on the YouTube stream that some of these lines don't come out as prominent, so I increased their thickness. So hopefully that that makes it easier to see. Um, as always, starting with um, Monero USD. Let me just say uh, real quick. So anybody that's listening on Twitter Spaces, if you actually want to see the charts, you just go, you know, watch it on YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah, it might make more sense than just uh, hearing some guy rattle on about price charts worth a thousand words. <laughs> so okay, um, here's our U.S. dollar price. Um, we continue to recover from uh, from the big crash earlier this month. We've got kind of this channel going on here. I've noticed it's a little bit hard to um, to draw trend lines, you know, like, do you draw it there? Do you bring it down here? And Monero, for whatever reason, Monero tends to have a harder time. I have a much more difficult uh, time drawing trend lines uh, on Monero than I do for other for other charts, but okay. Um, so anyways, we're, we're kind of like bouncing around in this channel. It's a bit of a rising wedge, which isn't necessarily the best sign, but it doesn't have to be a bad sign. Um, so yeah, the US dollar prices is, is looking okay. But of course, uh, versus Bitcoin, you know, we're looking really good. Um, what are we? That's the weekly chart. Yeah. So we continue to just continue going up. Uh, and this has been happening really all year long. Um, the things that I that I really wanted to point out today was um, so right here, this line goes back to um, even like uh, 2014, some of the original price history from an arrow. So getting above the 009 level is, is definitely going to present um some resistance for us coming up. Uh, so people should be aware of that. If they like to trade the ratio, uh, you might, um, you might think about taking some profit around that area. Um, but we still have, we still uh, broke above. Let me go to the daily. So you can see here that we had this sort of rising resistance and we've pretty much broken above that. That's not to say that we couldn't fall back below it, but, um, at some point in the future, these lines are going to intersect. In fact, it might be better to redraw this line, something like that at this point. Um, so it's kind of like we have this rising resistance line here that, um, that uh, it's always good when you have to redraw lines um, higher. Usually when you start redrawing lines lower because price is breaking down, that's not a good thing. But it works the same on the reverse. So when you start breaking resistances to the upside and then you have to redraw them, uh, that's a good sign. That's, that's kind of a place you prefer to be. Um, and then, of course, we've got, uh, you know, we have all of this area right here that was significant for the ratio. So at some point, um, I do believe we'll break this 009 area. That's just what the fundamentals say. People are getting into Monero. We have um, we have good price dynamics relative to most other coins. So eventually we'll break through this uh, and we'll be up here at the 011 level. Uh, probably that'll happen sometime next year. Um, the current... Uh, the current divergences don't look so bad, except for Poloniex has tended to be low for the past, I don't know, the past week. Um, so Poloniex in blue, you can see that their prices are somewhere around a quarter percent lower than Kraken's price. Um, and again, this is kind of an average, and these lines will change slightly depending on the timelines that you look. So I'm doing um, I'm doing a moving average, right? That's the only way, because the thing is, 
on the second by second, um, you know, the five second charts, their prices are always oscillating. So you have to look at what is their average divergence um, over the course of many candles to really get a picture of what's happening. Um, and then, of course, we can make our volume adjustment. Again, this is important because it tells us how much real volume was done at these divergences. So, um, you know, you can see that Binance in red over the past week has had these kind of these dips here. Um, where they're doing volume below cracking. So to me, that looks a little bit like some mild price suppression. But um, let's go to a longer time frame. In terms of, of the big picture, that's, they're really not, um, that's really not so bad. Like, for example, this was when they shut down uh, withdrawals in August, right? So they shut down withdrawals and then they, they diverged their prices lower. And that's kind of a double hit because you can't even get off. Like, let's suppose you got trapped in Binance and the price is being diverged lower than Kraken. Well, you don't want to sell on Binance now because their prices are lower. So it sort of encourage you, encourages you to just stay trapped in there. Uh, so it's kind of a dirty trick that they do. Um, but overall, they've kind of been up. They've kind of been down. I mean, you can see clearly they've been down more than they've been up. Um, which is not surprising. It, it does seem like they, they don't want Monero to, um, to get relative attention. Uh, and then we've got um, the XMR um, dominance. So you can see that uh, this is where we all thought we were bottoming um, back at the beginning of the bear market, uh, bull market, sorry. And um, it's right where we came up and we're, we're still like, we still have a long ways to go. And, <clears throat> and the big thing is that, uh, you know, we're coming up on this resistance right here, this big resistance line, and it's hard to think that won't pose some challenges for us to get above. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the place that I really want to see us get back to is is that um, now it's a resistance line. But, you know, it was a support line for quite a long time. But, um, you know, with the crash of these tokens that really never probably should have been valued that highly in the first place, um, I do think there's a reasonable chance that Monero makes it back up there. Uh, the longs and the shorts remain um, uneventful. There's just nothing going on here. Uh, so the red being the Monero shorts, the green being the longs, and then the white being the net position. So we're still net short on Bitfinex just a little bit, but um, it's not it's not anything significant. Um, you can see this is Monero compared to everything else, kind of kind of the same deal. Maybe we can look at uh, Stellar today. So apart from the big pump that we had on the original Monero bull market. Um, we're basically sitting at, we're, we're pushing above these sort of lifetime chart versus chart, right? Uh, Stellar versus Monero, horizontal areas of significance. Um, there's hardly any reason to think that Stellar will perform well. The only thing that it could get is if um, Ripple settles its case with the SEC. And at this point, I don't think it matters what the settlement is. Unless the SEC is like, hey, you guys are done for. We're shutting you down forever. Or like, we're going to fine you. I don't know, $50 billion or something ridiculous. Any settlement will end up being price positive for Ripple. So um, probably Stellar will get some bump from that. But the price action on Ripple has, for its entire lifetime, has been boring, nothing, stupid. And then like in the course of one week or two or three weeks, it'll pump by like two, five, 10 X out of nowhere. Um, and then it'll just slowly bleed off. Ripple has almost never had like strong organic price movement to the upside. I've just never seen that in their chart. Whereas a coin like Monero, because we have organic price support and people actually use the coin, we do see these long time frames of um, steady organic price support. Now, hang on one second. Excuse me. So here's, uh, here's our look at all of the different coins relative to each other and how they've been doing. Let's go to a shorter time frame. You can see that Litecoin, um, has outperformed everybody. I think this is related to um, to Dog, their merge mind. Um, and of course, when Elon bought uh, Twitter, you know, everyone's like, oh, Dogcoin, you're going to be able to pay for your $8 blue check mark with, uh, with Dog coins. So I think LTC gets a bit of a boost from that. Um, I don't think necessarily that they have strong long term potential. Although at the same time, I do have to admit that it does seem like people use them as a currency a little bit. So um, they do have that going for them, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily as used as people would, as they would, as the true believers of Litecoin would have us believe. Uh, so here's um, here's the overall picture of all the markets relative to each other. Um, we've got um, crypto has kind of been making a comeback, as you can see in purple. Everything else has just been basically flat for for most of this week. Um, 
Yeah, everything is is uh, pretty flat. Um, the dollar is is in green, and it's kind of trying to make a comeback. It looks like, but this is also so when we talk about Z scores, um, given time, if your price doesn't move at all, your your Z score will naturally trend back to the center line to the zero point, even if price doesn't move. So some of this um, movement here on the dollar, that's not like price uh, price movement to the upside. That's just um, that's just how it works when you when you're talking about um, standard deviations and um, and moving averages, at least the way a Z score is. And maybe maybe one day we'll get into exactly what a Z score is, but it's it's a very useful metric. Um, but yeah, anyways, the short story on this is that not much has happened this week. It's been kind of a flat week overall for most things. Um, so yeah, nothing nothing too exciting going on at the moment. Um, so one thing that I really did want to share today is the yield curve inversion. So the United States government offers different treasuries and sometimes they're called bonds um, at different maturity lengths. So you can buy like a one month bond, a, I don't know, a six month bond, one year, two year, five year, 30 year. And the idea being that if you're gonna lock up your money for longer, you expect to get a higher interest rate. So you expect that the 30 year should give you a higher interest rate, a higher yield than say the US one year bond. But what happens is we yes. see yield curve inversion. What's that? No, go ahead. I don't know what that was. Okay. Huh. So what, what happens is that we see yield curve inversion. And these inversions are typically, to me, they're associated with um, sort of market crashes or market pullbacks, recessions. They're typically associated. It's not 100%. Um, the thing that I, the thing that I've personally seen is that it's the, it's, it's the return to normal is where you typically see the crashes. So, um, what you can see here is that the 30 years in purple and then kind of by color, it goes down on time frames. So 30 year in purple, blue is 10 year, um, aqua would be the five year. Um, the green is the two year, yellow is one year. And then the white line is the federal funds rate. So that's the overnight lending rate in between banks. Now, the thing that I, I really wanted to show is that we are in a full, complete yield curve inversion, which I don't think that I've seen. I need to, I haven't really scrutinized the chart to see if this has happened any time before. But essentially, the the lowest um, the lowest maturity yields, or sorry, the lowest maturity bonds are also yielding the highest, whereas um, the ten year and the thirty year are yielding the lowest. So it's hard. I'm not an expert in this. It's hard to say exactly what this significa, signif, uh, is significant. But to me, it's it's a picture that um, things are kind of at their maximum distortion point. Like this really shouldn't happen. Uh, and it especially shouldn't happen to this uh, to this level. Now, one thing that I also do is I take all of these yields and I subtract each one from the other and then I average them out. And so it gives you an overall picture of how inverted the yield curve actually is. So this is kind of very long time frames here. We're on the weekly chart. And you can see that going back to uh, 1989, we had yield curve inversion there. This was the, um, right here is the dot com yield curve inversion. This was the pre 2008 catastrophe yield curve inversion. And then we're sitting at levels that we haven't seen since, um, since the dot com era. Now, the thing is, if you, if you notice the date right here, this is 2000, right? And then 2001 starts starts right around here. So you can see that the yield curve was correcting back to normal uh, before the stock market crash, because the, the real crash didn't happen until 2001. And then same thing here. You've got this yield curve inversion that continues for 2006, 2007, starts correcting to fair value. And then finally, 2008, after the yield curve corrected, you saw this big market crash. Now, the dynamics across all markets are significantly different than they were in previous decades. Um, simply because people understand now how important the Federal Reserve is. They understand that it's really monetary policy that's driving everything. So you see people, you see the markets move in advance in the expectation of what monetar monetary policy will be, as opposed to in the past where it used to move after they made the changes. So I'm not sure necessarily how predictive this is, but it certainly does represent that something something isn't quite right. Here's the zero point, and, uh, and essentially we're, we're well below zero. And again, that's because that's because all of the yields are basically inverted right now. Everything except for the ten year and the thirty year. Um, so just know that that exists. If it if you find that interesting, I definitely recommend um, reading more about it. 
And if you have any ideas, shoot them my way. Cause I'm still, you know, I, I, I don't like fully understand the bond market, not as much as I would like to. And the thing is it does drive most everything else. Um, we've got our overnight, um, the repo agreements. Again, this is money that gets put with the federal reserve overnight. People get a small interest rate for that. It's institutional money largely. Um, and we're looking at over $2 trillion, but like I said, the thing I want to see is uh, is I want to see this come down. We want to see this money getting reinvested into the stock market. So as of now, this is a good sign. This is the kind of this is the kind of sign you want to see to expect that hey, maybe some long term reversal could be happening. Um, so that's good to see uh, the reverse repos dropping. Um, one thing that we didn't look at, we haven't looked at before, is oil. Um, so this is the price of crude oil, and we're kind of in this um, this broadening structure here now. It's good to keep seeing oil. We want to see oil down here. Really, we would prefer to see it break down below this line. It, it, I can't. It's hard to think that oil is really going to go back at like fifty dollars, right? Um, but we do, we do want to see oil continue to stay down here because if oil goes to the top side of this trend, that means inflation is going to go higher. That means the Fed has to keep raising rates. That, that's really not. That's not good for people that are in risk assets like stocks and crypto. Um, then uh, we've got the dollar here. So. The thing I wanted to show with the Dixie, um, so I'm kind of setting up a thesis. There's there's a thesis that I, I have about what we can expect for price going into next year and probably for most of next year. So um, you can see that the dollar essentially hit these highs, started coming down. Um, and right now, one thing that we're seeing is, is divergence. We're seeing the Z scores, which is, again, kind of like RSI. There's this momentum divergence happening where we're getting higher lows on the Z scores. And then the dollar is getting just slightly lower lows. Um, so what this indicates to me is, is the potential for a reversal here. So the dollar topped out, you know, it really went higher than pretty much anyone expected. Um, there's only a few people that really thought we could make it that high. Now, typically on reversals, you don't just peak and then just reverse. Sometimes you do, but um, we should expect some kind of return to try and test like some level around here. It, it could be like a horizontal level right there. In fact, that would probably be the first place. Um, the first most likely place to, to look is to is to try and come up and then maybe hit this level here. So if that happens, you might expect a little bit of a pullback on the stock market and another pullback in crypto. We still have black swans in crypto. There's Genesis on the horizon that could be going bankrupt. Um, things just look shaky. Maybe um, maybe that was the bottom, right? It's hard to say, but um, I, I still didn't bite. I still wanna see one more low. Maybe I'll get caught waiting too long if it's possible. Um, and like I showed you last week, what, what we're seeing on stocks right here is divergence again. So with Z scores, with RSI, we're seeing higher lows, right? We're seeing this start to go back up. Meanwhile, the, the actual uh, price is making slightly lower lows. So my thesis then is that, oh, and then there's, sorry, there's one more thing here. Um, a couple more things that I, I may have missed. Bitcoin. Oh, I guess I didn't get that chart in here yet. Um, well, anyways, um, I'll just describe it to you. So let's go to a little bit of a longer term picture. This line right here is like the major, that's the major um, bear market resistance line for um, the NASDAQ. You're going to see something very similar in um, uh, on on the S&P. Let, uh, let me try and find this chart here real quick. I'm sorry, this might take me uh, just a second. I need to find my crypto charts, my overall crypto charts. This is it. So let's go to the daily. Now there's kind of a lot of lines here. Hopefully this isn't too confusing, but this is the main line that I want you guys to focus on. Um, okay, yeah, this big line. This is essentially the, the bear market resistance line. You notice that um, we kind of have popped above it. Maybe if we go to the weekly, this will be more clear. Let me get rid of some of these other lines too. Some of this stuff is confusing. It will detract from, from the main idea. Okay, here we go. So this is crypto, this is weekly total market cap. Um, let's go back to the daily. And this is kind of our, our uh, bear market line here. Oh no. Sorry, I had this chart prepared, but I was switching all my charts over to um, having the lines be thicker so they're more prominent for YouTube since the resolution isn't great and 
I'm not quite finished with that. So anyways, you can see, um, you know, we kind of popped into this zone here. We, caught, we came right back into this zone again and fell below it. So essentially what's happening is crypto and stocks are coming up on very large sort of uh, macro bear market resistance. Um, and that's happening kind of right here. And that should be happening within the next like three to four weeks. And then the same thing is happening for stocks, right? We could um, we could see the NASDAQ kind of come into this line here, maybe January. And then maybe during January, February, we see, see some kind of pullback and that could happen. You know, that could bring us down into these pre-COVID highs, which has really been my target the whole time. Um, maybe it takes longer to get there. Maybe we never get there. I don't know. But my thesis right now is essentially that we should see mildly positive action for the next few weeks. Um, Monero, crypto, stocks, everything looks like it kind of wants to keep going up. Um, we're going to hit up. We're, we're going to end up hitting into this resistance. And that could that could act as a temporary stop for us going any higher. Take a pullback and then sometime maybe. Um, maybe March, maybe the end of February, maybe April. But at some point next year, after that pullback is over, I think we're going to end up breaking through these resistances. Maybe we'll hit some of these targets. Um, we should end up completing this um, this momentum divergence that, that I've been telling you guys about. The idea being that you know we'll see prices um, kind of hit this again as we bottom out. And then that would be, that would set us up for like a broad, move to the upside next year for at least like maybe three, five, six, seven months next year. Um, but I, so I think temp, so to be clear, short term, I think we have mild positive action going forward um, into the new year at some point, late December, January pullback. And then after that pullback is over, I think that we'll actually break a lot of these bear market resistances um, and people will start singing about how we're in a new bull market. That probably won't be the case, but it could be the end of the bear market. That could be like the bottoming signal. Um, and, you know, people I, I hear a lot of talk about like black swans and all these terrible things and the stock market's going to crash. But I don't see any major black swans for the stock market. Um, we have the we have the bond market. They managed to get yields up by some miracle with without crashing the markets. I mean, OK, we're down like 20, 30 percent on stocks, but that's really not so bad. And they managed to bring rates off of a floor of basically zero. Um, but, you know, 2000, we had the incredible dot com explosion. 2008, we had a hyper financialization of the entire economy. Uh, and then that leverage had to unwind. But we don't I don't really see the same kind of problem here um, in the broader macro sense. So I, I'm starting to think that we maybe we don't have a big, long stock market crash. Perhaps we could be flat for another year, for another two years. That's possible. Um, but anyway, so I, I think the. The, the general outlook is, um, is is pretty okay. Like it's it's probably not a bad time to rebuy here, or at least to rebuy a little bit. So um, that would be where I see the markets right now. Anybody? Any questions? <laughs> I'm good. Uh, I don't know if people have questions <laughs> in, the, in the audience. Uh, it'd be hard to take them from the Twitter, right? So right now we got 24 people watching on YouTube, and then we have like another 10 people on Twitter. So yeah, people that are watching on YouTube, uh, try to log into the Twitter space too. So we bring more attention there. Buddy. Well, cool. That was awesome, man. Um, I don't know if you want to stick around to jump into the Twitter space or whatever you got to do. Uh, but great, yeah, great. yeah, I would very much like to hang out on Twitter. Yeah, pe people are loving these, man. People are loving them. Well, it was good times. I, uh, I always enjoy giving you guys price updates. Um, <laughs> I'm a... Uh, just get me up uh, to that 0.02 uh, XMR to BTC by Monerotopia. That's, that, that's oh man, more. I'll do my best. Uh, <laughs> let me let me start putting out some more propaganda. I'll quit talking negative on the market. It's all positive <laughs> from here on out. Make it happen. We we, we need Snowden, you know, uh, sh shilling Monero, and then maybe we'll get there. Maybe um, I don't know. Maybe we could do a, a CSS or something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Vic uh, tweeted he would uh, donate five thousand dollars to a charity of Snowden's choice if he comes on and does a Monero talk. Oh wow, that's pretty yeah, cool. That was pretty good. Yeah. All right, Bobby. Well, I think Sunita reminded me to um, to sign off with uh, uh, follow <laughs> follow us on Twitter, um, <laughs> YouTube. I just made a Twitter. I'm Bowdy Anarchist at Bowdy Anarchist underscore. It's important. The underscore is important. Uh, yeah, or sure. screen title Monegro, body anarchist on Reddit. So, thanks, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Body. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. All righty.